Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Yale Law School Faculty Book Talk Series. This is a super special edition of our series because it features a couple of our own librarians uh, here at Yale Law School. So it's, it's a real treat for me to introduce um, the author of the Yale Law School Guide to Research in American Legal History, John Nan, and providing commentary this afternoon, Mike Widener, our rare book librarian, and both our lecturers in legal research. And I'm just going to do a quick introduction and then turn it over to John and Mike to proceed. So John Nan is our senior librarian for reference and instruction and collection development and a lecturer in legal research here at the Yale Law Library. He has served as a librarian at several libraries uh, and law schools here in the Northeast since 1988. John has taught advanced and introductory courses in American legal research since the early 1990s. He has also taught foreign and international legal research and courses centered on the use of technology in legal research and in law schools. He was among the earliest computer services librarians and educational technologists in American law schools and in American uh, academic law libraries. He has co-taught or taught uh, research methods in American legal history for over a decade. And this is the book based on that course, the Yale Law School Guide to Research in American Legal History. It was published in June of this year by Yale University Press. Although John is skilled in research methods and issues in a wide range of topics and jurisdictions, his primary focus is on American and European legal history and the law of the European Union, Great Britain, and the Commonwealth. Providing commentary this afternoon is Mike Widener, our rare books librarian uh, and lecturer in legal research. He's been here with us at Yale Law School since 2006, after 14 years as head of special collections at the Tarleton Law Library at the University of Texas at Austin. He is also on the faculty of Rare Book School at the University of Virginia, where he has taught the course Law Books, History and Connoisseurship since 2010. In fact, I've been a student in his class. Several of us no, have been. So I. <laughs> He has authored several articles and book reviews in the fields of archives, rare books, and legal history. Recently, with co-author Mark Weiner, uh, he co-authored Law's Picture Books, the Yale Law Library Collection, which won the Joseph L. Andrews Legal Literature Award in 2018 from the American Association of Law Libraries. And many of us have seen that book because it was featured in his Grolier Club exhibit a year ago. Mike has spoken at conferences in the US, Mexico, Italy, Australia, and Sweden. He's been a consultant at the law libraries, uh, at many law libraries around the country, uh, along with his wife, Emma Molino Widener. Um, and uh, they've been consultants at law libraries at the University of Wyoming, the University of Adelaide in Australia, and the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. He was the 2012-2013 chair of Legal History and Rare Books, Special Interest Section, of the American Association of Law Libraries as well. Mike is a member of the Grolier Club and the Board of Trustees of the Connecticut Supreme Court Historical Society. So please join me in welcoming Mike Widener and our author, John Nan, for today's very special book talk. Thank you, Teresa. You're welcome. Um, I'm going to, in planning this, I decided to revert to my former career where I was in broadcast journalism and do an interview of John. So John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mike. And congratulations for this is a great book. I Thanks. really loved it. It's a book I wish I had had 25 years ago when I started doing this work. Uh, uh, so uh, I loved looking through it. Um, so I want to first tell us just, a, this is based on a course that uh, Morris and then you and Morris taught together, right. uh, research methods in American legal history. How did that course come about? So the course uh, predates my time with it. Morris started it shortly after he retired as the law librarian here at the law school. And um, he wanted to further his, uh, he pass on his love for uh, legal history and legal history research. And so he started a course and taught it for several years. Um, and it was, a, uh, it was a great course. I actually sat in and, and, and took it. It was in some ways a traditional legal research class. It was a very a bibliographic focused class. Um, and so I, I took the class and I expressed interest in it and worked with Morris on a, a number of projects. And he brought me along and asked me to sort of give uh, sort of the, the modern view, some of the technology uh, views to, uh, to the course, try and bring it up into the 20, 21st century. 
which I think is kind of funny because Morris himself was quite a uh, uh, quite a modern thinker in research, oh, but yeah. uh, but he he always wanted to add add more technology to it. So um, I started on bringing in technology to the course, and then uh, just slowly took over the course. And as as he became ill, I kept teaching the course. And um, when we thought about doing the book, we originally had looked at it very as a traditional book in a very bibliographic form, um, but thought early on that we might tr be able to try and bring in some additional uh, views it takes on the, on the material by reverting to a, a chronological form. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was an interesting uh, thing about, I might, this might be a good time to just review real quickly, okay. just skim real quickly through the contents. Uh, after the introduction, there's uh, chapters on general bibliographic sources, and then the English foundations of uh, American law, the colonial law, constitutional law from the 1780s, the early republic, 1790s to 1870s. Uh, Research gets organized, which is an interesting <laughs> way of conceptualizing that period, 1880s to 1930s. I, I love the idea, of it, by the way. And uh, then the administrative state from the 1930s to today. Then there's chapters on archives and practice materials, international and civil law in the United States, uh, language and biography, and non-law research. Um, so tell me about that, that chapter in particular, about... Uh, research gets organized. I really, I love the, the conceptualization of that. Well, as, as, we were, as I was looking at it and organizing the material, I, I thought that um, American legal research or American legal history breaks down into several distinct periods. And I saw, I think that the um, periods of history and the periods of legal publishing line up pretty interestingly. And we could see some interesting um, changes uh, as we go from, from chapter to chapter in this. And I think that when we speak, when beginning in the 1880s, we get the sort of the failed effort by the federal government to codify American law, but we also get at the same time the rise of the, uh, the organized publishers, the, you know, the expansion of the early digest systems into the West digest system. We get, um, you know, the Shepherd, Frank Shepherds and the kind of uh, citation tools becoming sort of universally available, um, and the industrialization and, and um, corporatization of this development. And so I think that it, really the 1880s or 70s or 80s mark a real turning point in the change of the way that uh, researchers dealt with the law and worked with the law. And so I thought it was a, a nice break there. And they start to bring in these sort of organizational tools that I think we really, we're still working with today. Yeah. I, I've talked about this in my course also about how you know that's really also when law libraries became came into their own, and you see legal literature beginning to assume uh, the aspect of a system, you know, especially with West, right. and you can't to have these systems without a library. Right. It's like the necessary uh, component to it. Right. You get Langdell's use of the library, or metaphors, the library is the exactly. laboratory of the law. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So uh, in this book, what would you say is Morris's essential contribution to the book? Where's Morris's stand in this book? Uh, I think that you see him throughout the book. Um, so the, the, the really the fundamental um, course the very beginning was his. And you can see, you know, some of his language, some of his, you know, the five methods of doing legal research are, are really some of the Morris, no. you know, straight in from Morris. But I think more what you see is the way of um, looking at legal research, looking at the law, um, sort of the, the, uh, the care, the historical um, comprehension and understanding, the uh, really desire to sort of bring in all the humanity of the law. And I think that's where, where Morris was, was probably one of the most amazing people that I'd met was his understanding and use of humanity and his interest in humanity. Yeah. And, you know, we were talking about the, at least the biographical sections in there. I think that's a, a strong flavor of Morris that I think had I come up with this book um, out of whole cloth, I probably wouldn't have thought of some of those aspects of this. Yeah. So where's your stamp in this? Where where do you see where um, does John Nan come out most in this book? 
Well, I think I think ultimately the structure of the book. Um, I think the uh, bringing it into some of the modern times. I think is is a lot of me. Uh, I think that the uh, the uh, oh, well. I want to say, I want to say a fair bit of it, but I think that it is mostly kind of my interpretation of Morris um, and my desire to be as sort of as Morris-like as possible <laughs> is what I see it. Yeah. All right, fair enough. Um, in the uh, here's the thing I've noticed in the book in the, on page five. You know, you said it says we have elected to take an American realist view of the terrain of right. his legal history research. Right. And so it might explain for a few people very briefly what legal realism is, and what do you mean by that statement about American realist view of the terrain? Well, so we're, we're uh, juxtaposing it to sort of the formalist views of, um, you know, the law is the law as written, and it's just, you know, merely applied. Um, and but the realist view, we're sort of looking at the whole person, looking at the whole society, and uh, considering how all of this impacts on really how the law develops and what the law looks like. And so that's why we've got things like um, the biographical information in there. We, we've spent a lot of time talking about um, you know, where to find court files, where to, you know, to see really what was happening in the lawsuits, where to find you know, sort of the underlying uh, government <laughs> documents, where to find um, sociological information, you know, where to find things that are really <coughs> Put the legal system in its in, in place in society. Okay, uh, I was going to add. You know, uh, there's kind of a turf battle in general in, in legal history between the uh, the lawyers and the historians. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody they all say that the other one's kind of uh, in, uh, in, in uh, encroaching on their turf, and uh, that brings up a, a related question about how they the different parties approach. Uh, legal history research, and more specifically for students, because this is you're aiming at, at teaching students yeah. how to do uh, legal history research. What is it that law students get most stuck with? What's what's their their main what's their stumbling block when we get into this field? Well, I think that the the, the, the danger with lo both law students and lawyers on, on going in one direction and historians going in the other direction is it's really a lack of. Um, uh, understanding your care for the way that the other uh, professions consider and look at the material. I think frequently you'll see with, um, with, law, with law people when they're encountering um, uh, historical materials, frequently they're looking at making an argument. So, you know, where are the pieces of information that's going to justify whatever my legal argument is? Mm -hmm. um, and really sort of a... a Outcome derived, uh, derived look at, at the material, um, and so we with, with law students, I think, and, and, and lawyers, I think the, the danger is not um, opening themselves up to the entire uh, the entire historical system, the entire way that it was at, at whatever time you're looking at, and so it's uh, you know immersing yourself in sort of all aspects of the way that the, the, that the society was and how the law could. Uh, you know, even reflect or not reflect it. And I think if you come at, at things without that kind of understanding of the way that the uh, place felt and smelled, then you run the risk of not really understanding uh, the words on the page of the law. I think um, similarly, though, the materials that we're looking at here are professional materials. These are materials made by lawyers, um, frequently for lawyers or, or their clients, and they've got particular professional purposes. And so I think not understanding the way that the profession is dealing with material, why things are important to the professionals or not important to the professionals, can hinder historians when they come looking at legal materials. So I think it's really understanding kind of both points of view is really important when working with this material. I think one of the things that uh, you know, like your thoughts on this is how... Uh, you know, lawyers are looking for winning arguments, and often, in historical terms, it's the losing arguments, the roads not taken, that help you to understand the, the big picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's exactly right, and yeah. I think it's, uh, yeah. Um, 
So what sort of what sort of the most common research mistakes that uh, these students make? Oof. Or historians? <laughs> Not just the students. <laughs> That's a good or question. Or um, Well, I would say most generally wanting to jump in too fast, too far, too fast, not not taking a um, time to understand the the language, um, not understand the way that the the preconditions, preconceived notions that they're bringing with them into the project, uh, not really thinking of how this idea might have been perceived or described or thought of 200 years ago. Yeah. And so I think that brings with a whole lot of baggage. I think that can bring you linguistic baggage, it can bring you baggage in how you structure your uh, analysis, how you structure your hunt uh, for materials. So I think it's really um, getting the context, context right. Um, that and, you know, not using the asterisk for the long S. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I've come across a, a, a similar problem. You know, this is kind of an aspect of this problem. I remember particularly at, at the, the University of Texas, you know, uh, somebody was, uh, they were preparing a brief actually for a, a U.S. Supreme Court case. Yeah. It was the case known as the soccer mom. Uh -huh. case. It was a soccer mom in Austin that had been uh, pulled over and handcuffed by the police for not having a seatbelt. She got really angry about it and took it all the way to the Supreme Court. So they're ta they're arguing to Scalia, you know, I mean, the originalists. So definitions yeah. start coming. And you, I, I had to work with the attorney about, he he had the idea, he had to get the, dic the, the Jacobs Law Dictionary that was absolutely closest to the date of the um, uh, of the case because that would be the one and I tell them, you know, that's not necessarily true You know people would get whatever diction at that time in early America You get whatever dictionary you can get your hands on it might be an edition that's 30 or 40 years old, you know, so uh, And it took a while to uh, Convince people of that uh, this guy, uh, but it also shows how uh, uh, Legal history becomes quite relevant now, you know the whole uh, I mean, you do spend some time, a good deal of time, you're talking about the whole issue of originalism, yeah. as far as it, how it's, you know, not as a proponent or a proponent, <laughs> but how it, it figures into legal history research. Yes. Might talk some about that. Sure. Well, I, I think originalism as a, as a concept is very interesting, and I think it, it plays out in a variety of ways working with, with this material. We see that... Um, People are, uh, it's really where we're coming into the conflict of wanting to use law for particular means and wanting to respect history. And there is a conflict there. And um, it's both, uh, both history is pushed back against the law in their um, arguments about originalism and lawyers are pushed back against history. And so I think, um, I think I begin to touch on this, but there's a very interesting sort of history, if you look at the way that, that originalism has sort of developed over the past 20 years or so, working with, you know, first it's, you know, totally history, and then historians say, well, that's not exactly right. And so it, we're getting, you know, pushing back against the way that lawyers are, are considering a history. But then historians are saying, well, but look, it's, it, I mean, the lawyers are saying, look, it's a little bit more, the law is a little more important in this way, and so it might affect the way that they're looking at it, and linguists get involved, and... So I think the, 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 the aspect that we really wanted to get to there is really didn't want to come down on sort of one side or the other. And I think that, that it's, a, um, uh, it's a really complex question. But I really wanted to show that this is a, you know, there's not really one, this is what originalism and this is what non-originalism is, or, uh, but that this is sort of a moving target. And there are arguments and impacts from kind of both fields and sort of pushing along where where and what you might consider to be originalism, and how some things that are really sort of straight out originalist are in many ways really not as anchored in originalism as it might look. And originalism is an interesting example also because it brings out a, a, a form of legal history research where you start going to sources that have nothing to do with the law per se. Yeah. Um, such as? Such as the dictionaries and... Uh, yeah, yeah, Johnson's Dictionary yeah. and all these others. Yeah. Yeah. 
So what are some of the other sorts of uh, non-legal uh, things that you've uh, tried to bring into the, the picture? Well, we've done um, a lot. So, and one of the things that I'm seeing a lot of is not only the, lang the language and dictionaries, which are among my, my favorite things, but um, empirical information. We're really trying to look at, um, you know, and as much as you can, you know, what are, what was population like in a particular place at a particular time? You know, what was industrialization like in a particular place and at a particular time? And how might that have impacted what was going on in these places? So trying to um, either see the numbers as a reflection on what society looked like and how that might reflect on, on the law, or in fact, as the numbers themselves pushed the law in particular ways. So I think you know, that's one of the other ways that I would like, I've really um, tried to bring that into the class and think, think is pretty important. Um, the biographical material, I think, is critical. Yeah. Um, I think that we often don't remember that these are real people. Um, and you know, not just the lawyers as real people, but the clients as real people. And that underneath all of these cases, there are you know, real, real stories going yeah. on. And um, there's some wonderful you know, books about some of these cases. Uh, but that's something that's always fascinated me that I've always often thought of, you know, would it be fun to see, look at, and research what the real story is behind X case or Y case. Yeah. Well, there's a whole book about that, actually, yeah. Simpson's. Uh, it's a great book. Case, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I've always argued that a lot of the trial accounts that we have, uh, we, the American ones in particular, yeah. there are lots of great uh, uh, screenplays oh, and, God, and, yes. and plays <laughs> and uh, lurking in there. I just think there's some wonderful stories. And the way it captures people's voices also. Yes. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, again, and it brings it back just to the point which I, I totally agree with about that law is about people, yeah. about people trying to get along. Yeah. Um, so the one, the one point that I barely, the one source that I barely got in here that is one of my favorites and I've, I've loved to do more with is the Old Bailey records, uh -huh. uh, just because it's in central London criminal court and there's, you know, 16th and 17th century or 17th, 18th century records anyway. And you can really hear people, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the dock. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. Uh, one area that I think you avoided a little bit, and, and I understand why, is, is literature. Yes. You know, I mean, and that because, and then let's talk a little bit more okay. about what you kind of decided. I mean, any book like this involves decisions about what to include and leave mm -hmm. out. And mm -hmm. so, what are some of the things that you decided that just weren't going to fit? Well, I think that I think you make a good point with literature, um, and a lot of sort of legal research process things we didn't include. Um, like what? Well, like mm -hmm. how to use a digest, really, or how to use a statute, oh. or really, I originally I'd had for a long time in there a chapter that got pulled near the end of you know how to do online legal research, um, mm -hmm. and you know I wanted to include these, but we have a, a limited space, yeah, and. Um, you know, ultimately, I thought, what is done elsewhere well? And I said, well, you know, I could say, you know, go read this book, and this will tell you how to use the digest or whatever. Mm -hmm. And this will tell you sort of its historical background, when it existed, and how it might have changed over time. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what do you think are some of the... Uh, you go through a lot of research tools in here. I mean, there's, yeah. that's one of the great things about this book. So uh, what are some of the uh, research tools and, and, and legal history research that they used to think are fantastic? What, what's your greatest hits list? Oh, man. I love foreign relations of the United States um, just because I love seeing, and it is unclassified federal government documents about foreign relations, memos and you know, cables and it's... Again, you can see I like to get at the real, what's really going on in the world. Yeah. And um, one of my favorite things, and I think I've got it in here, is a, a cable uh, from um, the U.S. Embassy in Tehran just a couple of months before uh, the revolution in 1979, saying, oh, it's all quiet here, nothing much gonna, going on, I don't really see anything happening for a while. And it's <laughs> just sort of fun to see those things. So yeah. I, I like that. Uh, I think the OED is, again, is just one of the great resources out there. Um, and, you know, it's wonderful here having the electronic version of the, um, the Oxford English Dictionary. It's being up to date. Um, it, it lets you, like, watch language change over time. And I've been really interested in watching and dealing with sort of 
the way that the same words mean different things at different times. Uh, so it's fun running through a particular you know, series of dictionaries to, to see them change over time, but also to watch in Oxford and watch it move over time. And I've got sort of an example in there, uh -huh. um, you know, tracking, I think, the word appeal uh, through time and how its meaning has completely changed um, over the past thousand years or so. <sighs> Bibliographies, I'm a big sucker for the bibliographies yeah. as well. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Me too. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Uh, so what sort of tools do you think are, are we missing? What would we like, what would you like to add that just don't exist? Well, it's, it's, it's actually something one of our, our, Nick Prilla, one of our faculty members has said uh, before it's digitized everything. <laughs> you know? uh, there, there are, I mean, I will tell you, it is a lot easier to do research on 19th century law in a lot of ways than 20th century law, than mid 20th century law. Uh, there are holes in really getting access to, or easy access to, or um, access to tools in ways that we can do sort of modern ways of looking at research, sort of the digital humanities ways of looking at things that, you know, fairly easy to do across, you know, cases in American law pretty easily, but, you know, older statutes or across um, just literature generally in the 20th century is basically lost. Uh, we can go back to the 19th century and we have all of that. Because um, I would have thought it would have been the opposite. You would think that, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's a hard time. Huh. Yeah. That, and then, of course, pre-printed press is really hard. So, yeah. you know, in the manuscripts. And, um, you know, it's fascinating stuff, but just it's it's so hard to get into manuscript collections. But Yeah. Uh, so what, this brings up another point about the whole, uh, dip, you know, between print and online, you know. <laughs> Is, is print uh, obsolete as a... As uh, a no. <laughs> I mean, I... I <laughs> you got a feeling as well. Yeah, Those are pretty yeah, clever. I think, right? No, but let's... No, I mean, that's... That, that's no, I think... I think your comments were bringing up that, that whole issue. Then. Well, it's good, because there are strengths and weaknesses to both yeah. methods. Um, I think the artifact itself tells us an immense amount. Um, the size, the weight, the paper, uh, the binding, all of that gives us a huge amount of information. Mm -hmm. But the ability to find every time a particular word is referenced, every time a you know uh, particular I've been I've been looking at you know how many times X sort of things have been cited by by different people. That's something you can't do in a in a print. I mean, theoretically, I guess you could do it in a print world, but yeah. they've done a couple of lifetimes, yeah. right? Right. But um, so I think both of them are really necessary, and I think that both should be. Uh, I, I would be really hesitant to be comfortable with uh, somebody who's not willing to, to use both systems. I think there are times that you need to use online resources, and I think there are times that you need to actually handle the documents and handle the materials. I think one of the things I've seen with, with students today is, um, I guess I'm, I'm dating myself a bit, but I'm old enough to, <clears throat> to remember when the times when you would have you know, 14 books of code open to various pages just stacked up and your and your reporters stacked up to get you know to see things change over time and I think you can get a real feel for that when you can see this pile of books in front of you um, where it's a little harder to get that context when you're looking at a computer screen everything sort of looks the same yeah, I, I've heard similar uh, comments from older attorneys you know <laughs> that, that, that having that doing online research gives you kind of a tunnel vision you know, that you don't really see the context. I, I remember one uh, uh, a, a attorney, an elderly attorney in, in, in Austin, was telling me that uh, uh, one of the junior attorneys was researching at some point and came up with like 10,000 pages of printout, literally. <laughs> and he said, just go to the Texas Digest. If there's your, your answer's right there, you know. So... Uh, we're getting close to time for questions. I want to add one last uh, question before we open it up. Uh, you know, I said I would love to have had this book when I begun. In many ways, it would have been impossible to write this book 25 years ago. Yeah. And the same thing's going to be true again in <coughs> not too much longer. Right. So are you making plans for a second edition? <laughs> what's, uh, what's going to happen um, with this? Not, not yet. <laughs> uh, what's going to happen with this is a great question. Um, because one of the things that I fundamentally believe when I'm teaching legal research and when I was looking at this and working on this is I think that there are concepts that are true across many different types of tools that I think it's critical to know about. Um, 
But there are a lot of things that people kind of get in, get in front of their face and worry about that I think are less important. And I, as I put it when I'm teaching the classes, I'm not going to teach you what button to push on Lexus or Westlaw. I think that you know they're going to move that button all over the place. <laughs> and so I can't begin to tell you where it is today or where it's going to be. But the idea of this is the way that an algorithm works. This is the way that a Boolean logical statement works. Um, this is a way that people break documents down in a particular ways. This is the way an index works. Um, this is the way that you know printing works. Are things that are have a pretty long shelf life. Yeah. Um, so clearly, there are going to be new tools coming on. There are new tools. I mean, I put this. To, I, I got one last tool in here that I heard about just as a, I was at the AAAL conference. I was talking to somebody, and like, gee, there's this. Wouldn't it be great if there was this? He said, okay. Uh, when are you publishing? Okay, I'll let you know. It's coming out just before you publish. So you can put it in here that this um, well, legislative history of the 14th, 13th, 14th, uh, the slavery amendments was, was coming out. Now, yes, right? it was quite timely It was really quite timely. It was like, it hadn't been announced yet, but it was like, okay, you know, you can get that in there. So clearly things are going to keep coming out that are, are I'm going to want to include. But I think that a lot of this, and, and you can see in here, a lot of stuff I cite is not that recent. I mean, there was some really great work done in the 19th and mid 20th centuries yeah. that brought a lot of this material to, to us. And, you know, we're still using them. Maybe they've been digitized. I think of the colonial records of the colony of Connecticut, which are wonderful. Um, but we're still using the 19th century books, even though they're now digital. And I can search them and use them on the, you know, archive.org or whatever. But it's still basically the same thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I've also given up trying to figure out where the future is. <laughs> <laughs> probably a smart thing to do. So. Well, listen, thank you, John. And congratulations once again on this. Thank you. So, uh, yeah.